somebody that uh, has different abilities, different skills than you. Uh, a great person may inspire us, and sometimes they do, but they cannot enable us. They cannot make us great. And sometimes that's overwhelming. You, you see somebody that you look up to as a standard for you, and you want to be great yourself, but you don't have the same abilities that they do. And that can be difficult. It can be intimidating. So what is the option? What are the options for those of us who maybe want to be great, uh, but can't seem to live up to an example that we see? And that example certainly can't give us those abilities. Well, there are a couple of options. Uh, some people fake it. Uh, they pretend they put on a face, they put on a facade, they pretend to be something that they're not, and some people make an entire career out of doing that. Some people try and fail miserably or ultimately uh, get found out. I'll never forget, uh, in 1990, I was uh, finishing up seventh grade. That, for those of you that, uh, uh, <laughs> that maybe are a little older than me, that'll make you feel good for today. There's your encouragement for the day. But uh, I remember a group, and most of you, some of you at least, probably remember a group called Millie Vanilli. Does anybody remember that group? Now, what are they famous for? They're famous for faking it. Yeah, they even won a Grammy for an album called Girl, You Know It's True, only to find out that it really wasn't true because they were pretending the whole time. And they ended up having to give their Grammy back because they had lip-synced the entire album, everything. Uh, they tried to fake it, didn't work out so well. And you see examples of that. You see people who, I mean, if you're pretending to be something you're not, you can only fake it so long. Uh, eventually, you're going to be found out. So what's the other option? Well, in order to be great, and I, listen, not from a worldly perspective. We're talking to be what God wants me to be. In order to, to reach the potential to fulfill the purpose that God has given me, what are our options. Well, you have to have the ability to do that. And while others, whether it's a president, whether it's a leader, a boss, a sports figure, uh, somebody else that we would consider great, while they can inspire us, they cannot enable us. But as a believer, I follow the Lord Jesus Christ. He lives in me and through me. He not only inspires me by his example, which he absolutely does, he also gives me the ability to do what he has purposed for me to do. So he works in me, but he also works through me, giving me the power and the strength to accomplish the purpose to, that he's given me. He says, you want to be like me? You want to live the life that I lived? I'm going to give you the ability to do that. You want to follow the path that I have chosen for you to fulfill the purpose that I've given you? I'm going to give you the strength to be able to do that. I'm going to give you the strength and the power to endure in life's ups and downs along this ride of life. I'm going to give you everything you need to make the impact that I have set for you to make in this world and for my kingdom. That's what he gives us, and that should give us joy. Knowing that Jesus not only inspires us, he also enables us, should give us an incredible joy in our lives. We're in this series, we're calling Joy Life, or Joy Ride, we're experiencing joy along the ride of life. Uh, the purpose of this series is that we want to experience joy. I want you to experience joy, but I also want for you to share that joy with other people and encourage them to experience joy. We should be the most joyful people in the world. But what is joy? Well, Rick Warren, we've been using his definition. He tells us that joy is the settled assurance that God is in control of all of the details of my life. It's the quiet confidence that ultimately, since he's in control, everything's going to be all right. Not easy, not pain-free, but from an eternal perspective, I am secure. And so because of those two things, I'm going to make the determined choice to praise God in every situation, in every circumstance. That is joy. Knowing that, that my circumstances don't determine my life, my eternity, that I am secure in the hands of God, that he's in control, and that, that I'm going to spend eternity with him, and he's going to provide for me in this life. Christians should be the most joyful people in the world. We've talked about the Bible mentions Joy, being joyful, rejoicing over 300 times. In Philippians alone, Paul uses a form of that word 16 different times. It is his letter to the Philippians about joy. That's the 
theme of the letter. He's encouraging them to be joyful. He's, he's saying they have all the reason in the world to be joyful. You and I have the reason, all the reason in the world to be joyful because we have two very important things. We have grace from above and we have peace from within. Grace is something that, that comes to me, that God gives me, that I don't deserve, and peace is something that happens within me that is not dependent in any way on my circumstances. And with grace from above, peace from within, how could we not be joyful? The problem is, is there are a lot of people who aren't joyful. They don't have joy. There are a lot of Christians who aren't experiencing joy because we understand that joy, while it's available, we have to choose to be joyful. We've seen chapter 1, Paul talks about, he concludes that chapter emphasizing living our lives in a manner that's worthy of the gospel. Uh, and that's uh, showing grace, showing being faithful, having unity, being steadfast in our faith. That's how we live in a way that's man in a manner that's worthy of the gospel. He continues that team theme. We move into chapter 2, he continues that theme. He encourages the Philippians to continue in their faithfulness, to be people of joy. He encourages them to be of one mind, to be selfless, to put other people's needs above their own. That that's how this living in a manner that's worthy of the gospel, that's how this is carried out. He says, you need to follow the example of Christ, to be of one mind, to have the mind of Christ, who himself was selfless. He put other people's needs above his own to the point to where he was willing to go to the cross and die. In verses 5 through 11, he, he knows, Paul knows, that they cannot do this on their own. And he says, so what, what you need to do is follow the example of Christ, be enabled by Christ, and, and, and look at his humility, his sacrifice, uh, his selflessness. And again, he, he was so selfless that he put others' needs above his own to the point to where he gave his life and was raised from the dead so that we could be forgiven of our sins. And then in verse 9, we read that God gave him the name, highly exalted him, and gave him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow on heaven, on the earth, under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He is our example, but he is also the one who enables us. We can't do this on our own. And, so, and Paul knew the Philippians could not do this on our own. We've, we've established the importance. Last week we concluded with the importance of having Jesus at the center of our lives. And if we have any hope of being joyful, if we have any hope of being like Christ, growing in our faith, fulfilling the purpose he's given us, he has to be at the center of our lives. He is our model. We know that. Today we are going to see how him being the center of our lives and him being our model, how that's seen, how that's worked out in our lives. Paul is writing to the Philippians. He's talking about outrageous joy, and he spells out the importance of keeping balance in their lives. The key to a lot of life is balance. And I'm not talking about pop psychology. I'm not talking about, you know, health and wealth or whatever. I, there, there is, in, in our spiritual walk, in the church, the key to health is balance in purpose, balance in what we do, missions, evangelism, fellowship, all of these things. The key to my life is a balance in spiritual disciplines and serving and growing in my faith. There's a balance, and this is what Paul is talking about, the importance of having balance as we take on the challenges of life. First, if we are going to have balance from a spiritual standpoint, the first thing we need to do is we need to balance purpose and power. We have a purpose. We need to know that purpose, but that has to be accompanied by the power of God. He gives us the power. Again, he's not only our example, he also enables us. Look at verses 12 and 13 of Philippians 2. So then, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence... But now even more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is working in you, enabling you both to desire and to work out his good purpose. Now, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. What does that mean? That's a verse that's quoted a lot, misunderstood, misinterpreted a lot. We need to understand first and foremost that Paul, he is talking to the church. He is talking to Christians here. 
So this has nothing to do with becoming saved. All right, this is not a works-based salvation. It's not talking about you earn your salvation. That's not what Paul is saving. Again, he's talking to people who are already saved. So what he's talking about is finishing well, fulfilling the purpose that God has given you. In other words, continue to serve the Lord, work out your salvation as long as you are alive, fulfill the purpose that God has given you, and finish well. Bring it to completion. We're a work in progress. We are constantly being molded and shaped into the image of Jesus. And we serve, we grow, we work out our salvation as he completes what he began in us. He who began a good work will complete it. As he completes it, we work out our salvation. Also, we have to remember there were problems in the Philippian church. That's one of the reasons he's writing this letter. They were losing their joy. There was some signs of disunity. And so he's, work, he's, he's writing this letter saying, okay, guys, there are problems that you have to deal with. Don't let that keep you from continuing to serve the Lord. Continue to work out your salvation. Continue to serve the Lord as you deal with these problems. Every church has problems. There's conflict. Work it out. Work out your salvation, continue to serve, but don't let that, that keep you from dealing with the problems in the church. You've got to work out the salvation while you deal with the problems. That, that word that's translated work out, it's also, the word is also used in other places to describe somebody working in a mine or working in a field, both of which result, the work results in something positive, right? You get whatever you're mining for, gold, silver, coal, whatever. Uh, but also, if you work a field, eventually you've got crops that you bring in. There's a benefit that results from the work. So the idea here is, is that we work out our salvation. We bring it to completion. We become what God wants us to become. We become like Jesus. We fulfill his purpose for our life. There's benefit. We work out our salvation, and there's benefit on the end, in the end, it's brought to completion. So that's what he's talking about when he's talking about working out our salvation. The Philippians, they had a long history of faithfulness. They had a history of, of joy, being a people of joy. They had a history of serving the Lord faithfully, spreading the gospel. And Paul doesn't want them to lose that. He knows there are issues in the church. He knows there's discouragement creeping in, and he wants them to finish well. He wants them to finish what God started, to bring all of that to completion, to work out their salvation with fear and trembling uh, as they deal with the problems in the church. Spiritually speaking, our ultimate goal in life as believers is his glory, his will for his purposes. I mean, that's the ultimate goal of every follower of Christ. We should live our lives for the glory of God. Uh, and that is the, the greatest outcome, the greatest benefit of, of working out our salvation with fear and trembling. But we don't have to do this alone. Uh, God doesn't say, okay, here, I'm going to give you all this to do, and I'm just going to leave you to do it on your own. He says, no, I'm going to call you, set you apart, but I'm going to be with you. Philippians 4, 13, it is God who is at work in us. It, it, he is at work in us, and that word for work actually carries the idea of energy. It's where we get uh, our English word for energy from. And so what God is saying is, is, I know you can't do this on your own. I know you can't work out your salvation on your own. I'm going, I'm going to give you, it's my divine energy working in and through you. I'm going to give you the strength, the power, the energy to be able to do. I mean, have you ever gotten exhausted serving the Lord? Have you ever gotten exhausted attempting to do all that he's called you to do? Have you ever gotten discouraged by that? I know I have. And so what God is saying is, I'm going to give you the energy you need. Uh, when you're at your weakest, I'm going to be at my strongest and be strong through you. I will give you what you need to fulfill the purpose that I've given you. God promises. D.A. Carson says this. says it this way. He says, God himself is working in us both to will and to act. He works at the level of our wills, and he works at the level of our doing. He works on us, in us. He gives us the desire, and he, as, if we are living in submission to him, he takes control, but then he works at the level of our doing. He gives us the ability to do it. And here's the point. God doesn't only work with us. He works in us. He works alongside us, yes, but he works in us transforming us, enabling us, giving us strength and power to do what he's called us to do. 
A few years back, you know, I've, I've shared I'm, I'm a Braves fan unashamedly and have been for as long as, as I was a fan of baseball because they were the closest team to where I grew up in Birmingham. Timmy is a Braves fan, and a few years ago, he began to get old enough to where he was learning the players, and he had a favorite player. At the time, there was a pitcher that was the closer for the Braves named Jason Grilly. His nickname was Grilled Cheese, which was perfect for Timmy because that's his favorite food, I think. It was then, still is. He loves grilled cheese, and he loved the player grilled cheese. We went to a game and got to walk around. It was Star Wars night. Timmy dressed up as Yoda so that we could go out on the field before the game and just walk around the field. Well, it just so happens as we approached the Braves dugout, there were several players there, and sure enough, there was grilled cheese standing there leaning over the railing, and Timmy got to give him a high five. And you thought, you would have thought, I mean, that was the rest of the game didn't matter after that. I mean, Timmy got to meet grilled cheese. And it was amazing. And, you know, guys like that, we all have heroes, right? We all have people we look up to, and they inspire us, and we should be inspired. But as much as grilled cheese, Jason Grilly inspired Timmy, he couldn't enable him to be a baseball pitcher. I mean, that's something that you're born with and you develop through discipline, through practice. People, great people can inspire us, but they cannot enable us. But the promise that we have in Christ is that in working out our salvation, Christ not only inspires us, he enables us, and he empowers us. He gives us what we need. He gives us the strength. And I want to try to illustrate that for you this morning. I'm going to play with glue this morning. It's not just any glue, though. Has anybody here ever used epoxy? Anybody? And why, do you, why is epoxy a good thing? Because it is stronger than ordinary glue, right? I mean, it, it forms a bond that if, as long as you let it cure, I mean, it's going to be a strong bond that's going to be nearly impossible to, to break apart. And so what I, I want to do here is, is do a little experiment with, with epoxy. And, and what makes epoxy unique is that it's two parts, right? You've got, uh, you've got the resin, and then you've got the second part, which is the hardener. And you have to have both. When you combine those two things, a chemical reaction takes place, and it forms a bond with whatever you're trying to glue together. So let's do a little experiment, okay? We're going to start with just the resin. We're just going to use the resin first and foremost, okay? And this stuff smells great, in case you're wondering, all right? All right, so we take just the resin, and we, I've got two bolts here, all right? Put a little on each. Just the resin, no hardener at this point. And I can put these together, and I can let them sit, but just the resin, I mean, it doesn't matter. I mean, it'll stay like that as long as it stays there, but it doesn't matter how long I leave that there. It's never going to form a bond, okay? It's never going to harden. So let's follow the instructions and do like we're supposed to and use both of them. We're going to use resin and we're going to add the hardener, the two parts, all right? All right. Should have wore a mask. It's really bad when you open up the hardener. All right, so we're going to have a little bit of hardener too. And again, two parts, both equal parts. You have to have both. The hardener is what creates the, the reaction, all right, the chemical reaction that's going to take place, all right? So we're going to mix them together really good, all right? This is when we need the theme to Jeopardy or something while I'm working. There you go. Servant's hearts right there. All right, so we're mixing them together. We're going to get them really good and mixed. Now we'll take two more bolts and we'll put them together. Now, I put this together. This is a pretty fast acting. There's some that um, are really fast acting that, that will start to, to form within like a minute and a half. This is actually six minutes, five to six minutes before it sets up. It cures in four to six hours, okay? So you leave that there. You've got both of these, okay? One of them is just the resin. One of them is the combination. Here's what's happening. And again, I'm not, some of you are a lot smarter than I am. I'm not a chemist. I'm not a scientist. But I do know this, that when you mix 
the, the resin and the hardener, a chemical reaction begins to take place. All right? When you put these two pieces of metal, what's happening right now as I speak is that it is forming a bond with the metal. And metal actually has pores in it. All right? You can't see them, but under a microscope you can see them. And that, that epoxy is seeping into the pores of that metal. And eventually it's going to form a bond that, that you can't break or is going to take a lot to break. It's becoming one with the metal, right? So here's the point. You and I are like this resin. By ourselves, we can only do so much. I mean, God calls us, he gives us purpose, but if we attempt to do it in our own strength, we will never, ever become what God wants us to do. I could leave this sitting here all night, just this resin, and I will always be able to pull it apart. It will never form the bond that the epoxy does when it's mixed with the hardener. And you probably guessed it, the hardener represents Christ for us. It is his power, it is his strength that gives us the ability to do what he's called us to do. And here's what happens when Jesus comes into our life, he becomes a, we become one with Christ, the Bible tells us. And that is necessary because it is his power, his strength, his ability that allows us to have the strength to be able to do what he's called us to do. We'll never be able to do it on our own. He's the activator. He's the one that comes in and that, that transformation begins to take place that he will complete. And as we become more like him, as we submit to him, as we rely on him, he gives us the ability to do what he's called us to do. And he completes the work that he started. Now, this is already starting to form a bond, all right? And as I leave it there, in the next four or five minutes, it's going to get really strong. I did this one last night. I mean, it is set up. I mean, you're not going to be able to break this apart. It's been setting up since about 8 o'clock, 7 o'clock last night. All right, it is, it is strong. The longer I live, the longer I spend my life with Christ, the more I submit to him, the more I become like him, the stronger I'm going to become. Because it's less of me, more of him. You have to have the strength of Christ. He enables us. He calls us, but he also empowers us. So we have to have a balance between purpose and power. It's his will. It's his glory. It's his purpose. He strengthens us. Next, we need to balance attitude and action. We have to have the right attitude. And then we have to, when it's time to act, it's time to go. We need to go. All right, look at verse 14. Do everything without grumbling or arguing, so that you may be blameless and pure, children of God who are faultless in a crooked and perverted generation, among whom you shine like stars in the world. Hold firmly to the message of life. Then I can boast in the day of Christ that I didn't run or labor for nothing. There are two sides to Paul's argument here. There's a negative side and a positive side. It starts with the negative side. He talks about grumbling and arguing or grumbling and disputing, some of your versions probably say. These are the other two joy stealers or two more joy stealers. We've talked about worry, stress, and fear where there's two more we're introducing today. Grumbling and disputing. Both of those things are joy stealers and both of those things represent the wrong kind of attitude. Do everything without grumbling or arguing. Grumbling is something I do individually. It's murmuring. It's complaining. Uh, it's it's, it's uh, causing disruption just by simply complaining or grumbling, murmur, murmuring about what I don't like about what's going on. All right? Paul says don't do that. Arguing or disputing is something I do with somebody else, right? I'm, I'm arguing with them. I'm creating doubt. My goal is to create doubt, to create dissension. Uh, to cause conflict between people or to be at conflict with somebody else. And, and so Paul's saying you have to, in order to be all that Jesus wants you to be, to have joy, then you've got to do everything without grumbling and disputing. Some people seem to breathe out complaints. Some people are experts at this. Uh, for example, uh, the, it's like the angry woman who following a trip to, the national, to a national park filed this complaint with the Parks Association. She complained that the sun was too hot that it melted her son's ice cream. That was her complaint. Don't know what the park ranger was supposed to do about that. Or you've got the air traveler who voiced her disapproval that there were too many clouds in the sky and it kept her son from playing I Spy because he couldn't see out the window. 
Other people just can't help themselves. Two examples. One, a man robbed a Wendy's in Atlanta. True story. He went... He was so put off by, he didn't get much from robbing it. There wasn't a lot of money in the cash register. He was so angry by that, he called the restaurant twice to complain about the amount of money he stole. (laughs) Not as bad, listen to this. News report, officials, again, true story. A guy by the name of Arthur Bundridge, Arthur Bundridge, he robbed a bank, a teller. He walks up to a teller and he demands $20,000. The teller gives him the wad of cash, he leaves, he gets home, he gets away, he realizes the teller shortchanged him. (laughs) He was so angry that he went back to the bank to complain and that's where police arrested him. (laughs) Some people just can't help themselves. Lord, help me from ever being that intent on complaining. Paul says, do everything without grumbling or disputing. Grumbling and disputing, they are joy sealers. And and if we, if you and I, listen, in all seriousness, those are funny stories, sad but funny, a sad picture of the world we live in. but, but, But here's the thing. If we want to have joy, if we want to rise above all of the grumbling, the disputing, all of the the negativity, the doomsday philosophy that we hear everywhere i mean turn on fox news and watch for an hour and and you'll be discouraged because of all of the doomsday predictions you know all the all the all that's wrong with the world if we want to get above that if we want to be people of joy and experience true joy in life paul's saying a key to that is you have to live your life do everything without grumbling and without arguing be at peace with god and be at peace with one another Besides that, I mean, verbal pollution is what Swindoll calls this, and, and, and it takes its toll. Not to mention the fact, what right do I have to pollute the air with my dissatisfaction in life? To try to, to, to steal your joy and to make your life miserable. I agree with the person who said we have no more right to put our discordant states of mind into the lives of those around us and rob them of their sunshine and brightness of their joy than we have to enter their houses and steal their silverware. I have no more right to steal your joy than I have to steal your possessions, but people do it all the time. Paul sees this this issue, grumbling and complaining, as a major factor in stealing joy from the church. He sees the New Testament church as being people of a new exodus who we've been delivered from our spiritual Egypt, from, from bondage and sin. And we've, we, we have been delivered, and we're going toward the ultimate promised land, the new heaven, the new earth, with Jesus. And he's saying he wants us to finish well. You know, the, the original slaves, the, the, the Israelites, didn't do so well when they had their chance to go in. And he's saying, listen, your eternity's set. You've got this promised land, but the journey to get there matters. How you finish matters. And he wants the Philippians, he wants us to finish well. We're to be examples in this culture that we live in. To be in the world but not of the world. To be a light that shines in the darkness. Look again at verses 15 and 16. So that you may be blameless and pure children of God who are faultless in a crooked and perverted generation. Among whom you shine like stars in the world holding firmly to the message of life, then I can boast in the day of Christ that I didn't run or labor for nothing. Here's where the positive side comes in, okay? He goes on and he mentions four differences between those who are Christians and those who aren't. And these differences, these distinctions make all the difference in the world. They're the positive side. We've talked about the negative side. Here are the positive side. The positive side, unlike non-believers, we are to be blameless, Paul says. This doesn't mean perfect. None of us are perfect. What this means, it's a, the, the word actually means a purity of life that's undeniable and unhypocritical. Consistency in your walk with Christ. Not perfection, but you're not a hypocrite either. You're consistent. What you say you believe, you live out every day. Okay, Consistently faithful. Another way to say it is free of defect. All right, we're blameless, pure, he says. This is unmixed or unaltered, unadulterated. This is, 
This is uh, the idea that, that I'm in the world, but not of the world. I'm out there, but I'm not affected by the culture. I'm not mixing with the culture. I'm not living the lifestyle of the culture. I'm, I'm inexperienced in evil is another meaning. Untainted integrity. This is the idea of integrity. Again, living the way I say I believe. Consistency. Faultless is another word that Paul uses here. This is the word that was used to describe the sacrificial lamb. The priest would make the sacrifice. It was unblemished. It was as close to perfect as they could find, uh, free of blemish. And then he talks about stars. The actual word here refers to luminaries. The idea is that we shine like stars surrounded by darkness. Let your light shine before men so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who's in heaven. That's the idea is that we shine. Again, Jesus working in us and through us, his light is shining through us to the dark world around us. And this is, these are the characteristics of that positive attitude, the attitude that's cultivated by Christ, becoming like him. And a positive attitude makes a huge statement in what Paul calls, labels as our crooked and perverse generation. In the world around us, we don't need to shout. I mean, there's a time for that. We don't have to shout. We certainly don't need to argue and grumble. All we have to do is shine. That's what we're called to do, to be lights that shine in the dark world around us, to show love and compassion toward each other. Jesus said, they'll know you're my disciples by your love for one another. We love each other. We don't argue and dispute. We should love each other and encourage each other, build each other up. People will see that. That's one of the ways we shine. It's contrary. We're looking out for other people's interests above our own. Following the example of Christ, contrary to human nature, people want to know why we do that, why we behave the way that we do when we do serve others. And that allows us to point to Christ. These are the aspects of a spiritual attitude that is glorifying to God, that is bringing Him honor and glory. In Matthew 5, 16, Jesus says, In the same way, let your light shine before men, again, so that they may see your good works. So there's no need to shout, no need to scream, No need to make a scene. Just shine. Shine for Jesus. That's what we're called to do. In Daniel 12, 3, we read, Those who are wise will shine like the bright expanse of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever. You know, I'd love to be able to tell you that that you or I, that that we're going to be the next Billy Graham, all right? Worldwide fame, notoriety for the gospel. And there may be the next Billy Graham in this congregation. I don't know. I doubt very seriously that that will be me, all right? Um, But here's the thing. You don't have to be the next Billy Graham. You don't have to be worldwide famous, known in every corner of the earth. You, You don't have to be the most famous. What we do need to do is fulfill the purpose that God's given us. And what we know is that as we go about making whatever impact that God has called us to make in our world, he will provide everything we need to make the impact he wants us to make. He will provide for our needs. So we have to balance attitude, having the right attitude with action, serving the Lord, doing what he's called us to do. We must also balance seriousness and joy. You know, there's a time to be serious. If I'm just completely honest with you, I don't think we're we're suffering from a shortage of seriousness in the church today, okay? There's a time to be serious. There is. But sometimes we take ourselves too serious. There is a time to be serious, but we should always have joy. I mean, that's what Paul's talking about here. We should always have joy. Even in seriousness, there should be joy. And sometimes it's okay to have fun. I like having fun. And we need to have fun, too. Look at what he says in verse 17. Even if I am poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, even if my life is over, if that is in fact what he's talking about, he's saying, I am glad. I rejoice with all of you. In the same way, you should also be glad and rejoice with me. Even in the midst of persecution, have joy. Paul's talking about Jewish sacrifices here. The priest would offer a sacrifice for the people, and then he would complement that by pouring later, pouring out a drink offering over that sacrifice. And what Paul's saying is the Philippians are like the priests making a sacrifice of faith. 
Their service is a sacrifice. And he's saying, I'm viewing my life, Paul's viewing his life as that drink offering that's poured out over that sacrifice as a complement to their service. He may be talking about his death, he may not, but what he does, he views his service as complementing theirs. And he's saying, hey, even if my life is over, I'm still going to rejoice. I know you've got problems in the church. I know you're discouraged, but rejoice. I know you're facing persecution, but rejoice. Paul was balanced. While talking about the fact that his days, he may be in his last days. Again, we've talked about how we don't believe he thinks that. He he believes God has a plan for him beyond where he's at in prison. but, But he knows it's a distinct possibility. And while talking about the fact that this may be the end of his life, which I think we all could agree is the most sobering thought a person can have, he's saying, even in the midst of that, I'm still, I'm, I'm, I'm glad. I'm going to rejoice. I'm going to be happy. I'm going to have the right attitude. I'm going to be positive because we're serving the Lord. He's still experiencing joy. We can't get through As we go through this letter, you're going to see we can't get through a major section of this letter without Paul talking about how joyful he is, at least at some point in that section, whatever section we're in. He was consumed with joy. He found the secret to joy, and that was in Christ, not his circumstances. And his circumstances were not good. They were were difficult at best. He maintained joy. A veteran missionary scarred from being beaten. Uh, I mean, again, he's in jail chained to a prisoner 24-7, but yet he still has joy. And the truth for us is that if we remain super serious, again, there's a time to be serious, but if we stay super serious all the time and all we focus on are the problems and the negative things in life, we will never have joy. We'll never be people of joy because that's uh, the, 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 the radius of our perspective will be too small and, and the, the focus of our hope, the tunnel of hope will be too long. We'll never get there. The light at the end of the tunnel will be too dim. We've got to focus on what we have in Christ and who he is and take joy from him and not our circumstances. We, we follow, follow Paul's example. Even though we may have a lot of pain and difficult circumstances, and I know some of you do, and Paul certainly did, even though we may have those things, we can encounter something every day that gives us reason to celebrate in the Lord. We, there's something that will happen to you or something. I mean, every day, no matter what happens to me, I can find something in my life to take joy from that God has given me that I do not deserve, something that makes me laugh, and, and listen, science has proven that laughter is actually good medicine, all right? It actually helps you physically. That's why I think sometimes we just need to do things as a church that are fun, that cause us to relax, fellowship, just to have fun. And it's okay to laugh every now and then. I mean, that shouldn't be all you do, but it's okay. It's healthy. Experts tell us that It only makes our lives better, lighter. It actually physically helps. Here's four ways. It distracts our attention. And I I enjoy a good distraction as much as the next guy. Come by my office sometime and I'll talk to you for a couple hours and you'll find out I enjoy distractions. (laughs) Number two, by reducing the tension that we're living with, laughter reduces tension, stress. It changes our expectations. And it actually, physically, it increases endorphins in the body, which are actually natural painkillers that we're built with. So it actually serves as kind of an anesthesia from physical pain. Not only physical pain, emotional pain. I mean, sometimes in our serious lives, we need to give ourselves permission to take a break, take a long walk, spend the day with the family, go fishing, whatever. Take a day off every now and then. Not every day. You won't have a job, but every now and then. I mean, sometimes we need to give ourselves permission to take a vacation. We need to recoup. We need that break from reality. We need to give ourselves permission to enjoy various moments of life. Um, because if all we do is, is, if all we are is super serious all the time, we'll never have joy. You've heard the saying, you can attract more flies with honey, right? I firmly believe that we will attract more people to Jesus with the sweetness of joy rather than being serious all the time. Again, there's time to be serious, but it's got to be balanced with joy. It's got to be tempered with joy. An important point to remember here. 
As you attempt, now listen, as you and I attempt to do what Paul's saying here, as we attempt to be people of joy, your biggest obstacle will be self. The biggest thing that's going to get in the way is yourself. My way, what I think is important, the first step to joy is submitting completely to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because when I allow him to have control, suddenly the pressure's off. I don't have to determine the outcome of my life. All I have to do is listen to him and obey. Do what he tells me to do. But our self, we have to, that can be the largest obstacle. So here are a few things to help you get started, okay? A few just simple pieces of advice that, that I have found helpful for me that hopefully will be a help to you just to begin the process. Number one, resist the urge to take credit. It's easy when we're serving the Lord. We don't get much attention. If you're in service, ministry for attention, for recognition, you'll never be satisfied. But in those moments, there are those moments where we do get acknowledged. And it's easy to get addicted to those moments. But again, remember what Paul says here. Have the same attitude as Christ. And and what was his attitude? It was selflessness. It was sacrifice. Thinking of others above himself. Instead of, of, of seeking credit, be quick, be slow to take credit, but quick to build others up, to encourage others, to give them credit, to encourage them. John Wooden, former coach of UCLA Bruins basketball team for a lot of championships, many national championships, he gave this advice to all his players. Good advice for us too. Talent is God-given. Be humble. He, he, he built that in you, Okay. Fame is man-given, be thankful. Conceit is self-given, be careful. Because those things tend to go together. Be humble. We must control the urge to take credit and then conquer the tendency to take charge. Listen, I, you know, I, I've shared with you, I'm not a natural leader, but God has made me a leader, and I will find myself in a group where we're doing something And now, because God has trained me in this area, I have a tendency to want to take over, especially if things aren't going the way I think they should. But there's got to be humility. I have to be humble as a leader. We all need to be humble. And and, and that, that goes for when we're leading a group of people, but especially as it relates to my relationship to Christ. You're going to constantly battle Self, your, your urge to take control of your life. Every day, I have to wake up and say, Lord, my life is yours. I'm submitting to you. I'm doing it your way. You're calling the shots. You are Lord. You're in control of my life, not me. You tell me what to do, and I'll do it. It's a daily struggle. But we have to have his power and his strength to endure. Now, I've asked Gracie and my niece. My niece, Becca, is here today, so I figure why not embarrass her, right? That's, part of, that's, that's a part of being a part of my family. That's, that's an agreement when you enter the family. Uh, she didn't know it, but that's part of it. So I've got a couple of books. Gracie's going to see if she, how long you can hold these books, okay? All right, three books. Hold your arm out like this, all right? And I want you to hold them up. You got it? You got it? All right. You want me to time you? I don't have my timer on. We'll just see. You tell me when it's getting to the point where you can't hold them anymore. When it's getting too heavy. Again, theme. (laughs) Is it getting pretty hard? Starting to get heavy? You're starting to lower it just a little bit. Can you go a little further? A few more seconds? It's getting too much? Come on, you can go a little further, right? (laughs) Yeah. Uh Is he getting too much? Okay, all right, we're going to give you a break. I mean, she's only going to be able to hold this so long, so Becca's going to help her out. Becca's going to stand here, hold it, hold it up. All right, how about now? Are you a little sigh of relief, right? You feel a little bit better, okay? So how long do you think you could have continued holding the books without her help? Not very long. Not very long. They would have ended up on the floor, right? Now that Becca's helping you, how long do you think you could hold those books? Long time. As long as she's helping you. You could probably stand here all day. We're not going to do that, okay? I know you all want to eat lunch. (laughs) Notice, though, this is intentional. Becca is holding. She's using more of her strength. She's in a better position to hold these books than Gracie is. In Matthew 11, 28, Jesus says, here, y'all can put them down. Y'all go ahead and have a seat. Thank you. In Matthew 11, 28, Jesus says, hey, if you're tired, if you're weary, come to me. All you who are tired, all you who are weary, you come to me. And I'll give you rest. 
take my yoke. Get in the yoke with me. I'll carry the heavy load. I'll do the heavy lifting. All you have to do is serve alongside me. Learn from me. Grow in me. Use my strength. Let me lead you. And I, you will fulfill. You will become what I want you to become. You'll fulfill the purpose that I've given you. It's, it's like Becca holding those books. It's his strength, his ability. He's doing all the heavy lifting, all right? That's part of serving. Yeah, there's a part for you to play. There's a part for me to play. But he not only inspires, he not only sets the example, he gives us the strength to be able to do what he's called us to do. True joy comes from first Lord, my life is yours. You bought it with yours. I belong to you. And then daily, making that same commitment and living by the power and the strength of Jesus Christ as he works both in us and through us. That's where we find true joy. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your strength. Thank you for, gosh, thank you for for, for calling us and, and setting us apart, even giving us a part in your kingdom work. But you not only give us a role, you not only call us and you set the example for us, you also enable us. You give us the strength and ability to do what you've called us to do. All we have to do is get in that yoke with you, learn from you and depend on you each day. Follow your leadership, obey what you tell us to do, do what you tell us to do. All we have to do is live in fellowship with you and you give us the instructions and you give us the ability to fulfill the purpose you've given us and you've promised that the work that you begin in us you will complete lord i pray that like the philippians we would be models of faithfulness submission selflessness toward each other but but most importantly toward you that we would truly allow you to have control of our lives and that as we constantly battle the flesh and and self's desire to take over that we would continually submit to you daily lord we know that that submission begins as we accept salvation as we give our lives to you and invite you to take over as we accept the gift that you provide through your death and resurrection the gift of salvation and I pray that if there's somebody here today who hasn't accepted that gift, that, that they would come during this time of commitment and make that decision. Allow me to share with them what they need to do next. For those of us who are serving you, attempting to live for you, I pray that you would just remind us fresh and anew that you give us the strength that we just have to depend on you, that we would live in submission daily to you. And whatever other decisions, Lord, if it's church membership or baptism, whatever it is, if those are ways we need to submit to you and be obedient, Lord, I pray that we would do that during this time of decision. Lord, may we be faithful as you are always faithful. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Stand for our time of invitation.